Shack here and welcome to Champlain College's TEDx talk on invisible forces. Specifically what I'll be talking to you about are marketing strategies and how some savvy marketers um, can influence customers without them even noticing it. So I'll start off with an example here. Perhaps you can relate. Um, you go to a fancy dinner, uh, perhaps with someone of the opposite sex or someone you were courting, you wanted to impress them, you wanted to have a nice dinner, and the waiter comes along and um, throughout this experience, uh, throughout this dinner, uh, the waiter makes a few suggestions, perhaps a bottle of wine, an appetizer or so on, and for the most part, you're in agreement. And uh, you say yes to his recommendations, for the most part. And then lo and behold, the check comes in this little folder book thing in a jig. And in it is this little piece of paper uh, with the bill. And despite a valiant effort on your, your part, you couldn't help a slight eyebrow raise um, when he opened up this little folder. And despite the size of this little piece of paper, it causes you uh, some degree of stress and panic. And um, you're like, how did this happen? And, um, well, there might have been some strategies used to get that to happen. And perhaps the incident, regardless of how it happened, has left you cynical and uh, bitter and you haven't returned to the restaurant since. Of course, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about a story a friend of mine uh, told me. We'll call him Fred. All right. So now, how did this happen? How did this um, this panic happen? Well, um, it could have just happened, or it could have been like a, a strategic move from the restaurant and waiter's part. Uh, perhaps they used this marketing strategy called price anchoring. Now, what is price anchoring? Basically, price anchoring is showing you an expensive price of item X, and then you're like, "Wow, shock." And then you end up buying something else, which is not as expensive, but still more expensive than what you planned on spending. Marketers know this. So where, when you go to a restaurant and you open up a menu, where do your eyes typically go? Okay. Well, research reveals when you open up the menu, your eyes go to the top right corner. That's the first thing you see. Now, restaurants who use this marketing strategy would typically put their most expensive item in that top right corner. For instance, if you went to an Italian restaurant, it might be, I don't know, a seafood pasta dish. And in the seafood pasta dish, you see it's like for $34.99. And you're like, whoa, $34.99 for pasta? That's a little expensive. But below that price anchor uh, is another dish, pasta primavera, which as you probably know, is pasta and vegetables. And that's $22.99. And you're like, you know what? I'm feeling light. You know, I don't want something too heavy today. So I think that pasta primavera sounds fantastic. And I'm going to get that. And then lo and behold, you go home and you're like, wait a sec. Did I just spend $23 on some catelli and some vegetables? Is that what I did? And that's essentially what you did. Now, how did they get you to do that? Well, they anchored you with the $35 seafood pasta, which you thought was excessive. So then you bought the pasta primavera, which in upon reflection is very expensive, 23 bucks for pasta and vegetables, but they anchored you that way with the higher price point. So that's, and I, I mean, and that can be pretend going to a car shop, a car dealership, and your budget is like $25,000 for instance, for a car <clears throat> example. And the salesperson shows you this $40,000 vehicle and you're like, whoa, okay, nice car, but not for me. And then lo and behold, you leave there and you bought a $30,000 vehicle, even though you went in knowing your budget was $25,000. How did that happen? They anchored you with the $40,000 price and they got you to spend more than you wanted to spend. Even And there's often marketers, they don't even necessarily plan or want you to buy the $40,000 car or $25 uh, $35 pasta. They want you to buy perhaps something else that has maybe a higher profit margin. It might be easier for them to make or sell or whatever. Um, other um, tricks uh, that um, restaurants might use is uh, perhaps you've ever gone to a, if you've ever gone to an all you can eat restaurant and I tend to have a large appetite and as do many of my uh, male friends and we'll go to an all you can eat restaurant um, and lo and behold, towards 30, 45 minutes of stuffing our faces, you'll notice the music will gently 
uh, lower in volume. And what is that? Well, that's basically them trying to tell you perhaps it's time to leave. Now, you don't realize what's going on, but as the music reduces in volume on a subconscious level, I guess it's time to leave. And of course, this is um, not nearly as blatant as cutting the music uh, altogether. Um, other ways music is being used, for instance, at the grocery store, research shows that if music is um, being used at the grocery store, it affects how fast people walk up and down the aisles. So research showed that when faster music is played on the intercom um, system in the grocery store, people tend to spend less time at the grocery store, meaning, and that translates into a smaller um, price basket. They end up spending less. However, when more relaxing, slower music is played at the grocery store, it actually increases uh, people's um, shopping cart size and they actually spend more at the grocery store. So a couple tricks how uh, marketers use music to influence us. Also, shopping cart size. Um, research shows the bigger the shopping cart size, uh, the more people uh, tend to buy. Um, and in one uh, research I read, in one study, when the shopping cart doubled, it actually increased people, um, the sales, by 40%. So just having larger shopping carts made people believe that, well, we need to, on a subconscious level, that we, you needed to fill it up more. You can't leave with a, a shopping cart that's a quarter full. So people tend to buy more just based on shopping cart size. Other techniques um, used at grocery stores, for instance, samples. I love samples, you know, um, as far as I'm concerned, free or stolen food is uh, calorie free. So uh, I love going to Costco um, and eating as many samples as I can. Uh, I'm not uh, shy to admit it. Sometimes I even play games and I try and take as many samples as I can from the same person um, before they catch on. Anyway, so research shows wh why does Costco give samples knowing that there's people out there who kind of um, tend to eat them and never buy. Well, overall, it tends to be very profitable. Why? Something called reciprocity. When someone gives you something for free, we feel the need, whether it be out of guilt, out of gratitude, to, re to reciprocate um, this um, goodwill gesture. So we tend to buy things that we otherwise wouldn't have bought. If we didn't get that sample, you would have never bought item X. But because you got the free sample, it increases people's likelihood of buying it. Other tricks um, retailers uh, use is something called a loss leader. So I used to be, um, when I was in university, a bartender um, at, a, uh, at a school bar. And so I became friends with all the bouncers. And how would you get these large men giddy? How do you get bouncers giddy? Well, one thing they all do is tend to work out and they love um, protein to increase muscle mass. One of forms of lean protein, inexpensive, is tuna. And tuna, when it's on sale for 99 cents, 97 cents, whatever, um, tends to excite bouncers. I've seen it firsthand, trust me. So lo and behold, you see in the flyer, tuna's 97 cents at your local uh, pharmacy or drugstore. So you decide to go out and buy it. However, it says only six per, uh, per person. So you make sure you take full advantage of the full six. Now, a savvy retailer would place these lost leaders, meaning it's below their cost, meaning they paid more than 97 cents per can, or perhaps it's break even point, um, in the back of the retail store. Why? Well, that forces patrons to go through the aisles to get to this uh, can of gold. And by doing that, lo and behold, people tend to buy more things. Try walking through a drugstore and only buying the one specific item you need. You walk through the aisles and you're like, oh, lo and behold, I need shampoo, I'm almost out. I need aftershave, I need razor blades. And all of a sudden, what you, you should have spent only $6 on six cans of tuna, you end up having a bill of $48. And you're like, how did this happen? I went in for six cans of tuna and I spent 48 bucks. Well, that's how it happened. Ikea. How many people in the history of the world have gotten lost in Ikea? I mean, there's been search parties, I hear, for some, depending. Um, it's this massive store, and it's designed to be a maze. Now, uh, 
a lot of good things about IKEA. However, one of the bad things about IKEA is if you wanted to go in for one specific item, they don't make it easy. And that's by design. Um, you go in for, just like the loss leader of the 97 cent can of tuna, you go in for a specific item, perhaps a lamp that you saw on their website, and lo and behold, you leave with candles, you leave with um, a nightstand, you, uh, you leave with all kinds of things. You leave with an umbrella, shelving unit. How did this happen? Well, they made you walk through the entire store, and um, they made you realize perhaps a few more items would look good in your massive blue shopping bag. Another technique marketers use um, is something called planned obsolescence. You get a shiny new phone, you're all happy, uh, excited about the purchase, and then the salesperson explains, well, do you have cables for it? No, I have uh, the other cables for my old phone. Well, the, the cable cables have changed. They, your old cables will not fit in this phone. You're like, oh, okay, and all of a sudden, you spend another 20 bucks on a three-foot cable. And lo and behold, you need a new case. Um, in addition to the new phone. So all of a sudden, your brand new $600 phone, you end up leaving there and you spent like close to $800. And that's not even to mention the extended warranty and the software slowdowns that some manufacturers instill in the phone, which brought you to the store in the first place. Now, um, you've heard perhaps of the term cognitive dissonance. What is that? It's when, an example of this is when you're at a store and you're debating between two items. And you're like, mm, which one do I buy? I'm going to this dinner. I have got invited. I have to bring a bottle of wine. You see two bottles of wine, you know, $18, $20. And you're like, which one do I get? And lo and behold, the $20 bottle of wine has this label on it saying it won you know, an award at the 2020 Australian wine tasting contest. And you're like, oh, okay. And going through your head is, well, someone who knows more than me about this category says this is a good wine. Good enough. Lo and behold, you bought the $20 bottle of wine instead of the $18 bottle of wine. Other tricks, return policies. Research shows customers are more likely to make the purchase if there's a return policy. And not only that, Customers are more likely to make an expensive purchase when there's a return policy. Gift with purchase. How many of you have gone to uh, the department store or a drug store and went in to buy some, I don't know, moisturizer? And lo and behold, beside the moisturizer you're looking at or considering is a bunch of products, including the moisturizer in it, only for about $15 more, you get a whole bunch of other products and it comes in this nice little gift bag. Well, guess what? Now you just spent $15 more than you planned on spending for the moisturizer. Another way to increase sales, male customer, do the math. Male customer, attractive female employee, and research shows a gentle touch on the arm actually increases the potential of a sale. Also, compliments from the salesperson the more specific also inclusive, in, um, increases the likelihood of purchase from the customer. Color, red makes us buy. When we had Target in Canada, or if you go to Target in the US, the re research shows that the red makes us more likely to buy quickly um, and put less thought into the purchase. Three for $6 two for $10, five for $15. You see this when you go to a grocery store often, and what happens is, well, from the power of suggestion, people end up actually buying five items for $15. When, if they truly wanted to benefit from, for instance, let's say it was five cans of soup for $5, if they truly wanted to benefit by buying a can of soup for a dollar each, they didn't have to buy all five, they just needed to buy one, and they would have got the one can for a dollar. But from the power of suggestion, five for five, more people are more likely to leave there with five cans of tuna when in essence all they wanted was maybe one or two. Vanity sizing, this is becoming increasingly popular. Um, where um, perhaps more um, with a female clothing, um, there's a, a size six dress, okay? And you normally take an eight, for instance. And you're like, is this really a six? But you fit into it, you feel good, like, wow, I like this dress, and it's only a six. What happens is those feel-good feelings um, that the label brought you 
makes you more likely to buy the dress. Even though in reality, it's an eight, and perhaps you wouldn't have bought it if it was an eight, but because it's a six, it made you feel good. Feel good equals often you're more likely to buy. So that's my little lecture on invisible forces, marketing strategies, influencing customers without them even noticing it. So the next time you get your credit card statement and it causes a slight eyebrow raise, like a la rock, um, and you have to go through the five stages of grief and you're asking yourself, how did this happen? Well, perhaps you now have some more insight on how uh, that piece of paper caused you some panic and fear. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you.